David, who was Lord Elgin and why did he bring the marbles to London? Who is Lord Elgin? He is Thomas Bruce, the 17th uh, Earl of Elgin. Um, he is the absolute flower, Calvin. He's the kind of person we would rather approve of. He's exactly the kind of person we should be putting in the House of Lords nowadays. He is highly educated. He's at Harrow. He's at Westminster. He goes to St. Andrews in Scotland. He studies law in Paris. He travels to Dresden to learn German. He is immensely public spirited. He is rich. He tries to develop industry. Uh, he builds a splendid Grecian style house for himself. And his essential purpose in doing what what he did, the uh, removal and bringing back to London of the Elgin marbles is very simple. It is to improve the arts in Great Britain. He sees it as an educational enterprise. And at the same time, could it be argued that by moving the statues to London, we've helped preserve them over the time? You can, again, the argument is double. It's much more than simply preservation. The bringing of the statues to London means that for the first time, what was then the centre, what still is, the centre of culture and, and academic study, was able to look at them properly for the first time. The, the impact of bringing them to Europe is to revolutionise the arts in Europe. It is to revolutionise our understanding of ancient Greece and Hellenistic Greece. For the first time, these things are studied properly. For the first time, they feed directly. You see, they become objects of, of poetry. They become objects of imitation. So what I think we need to understand is, again, all this argument about uh, you know, cultural expropriation uh, and imitation and whatever gets it wrong. What we're seeing exactly at this particular moment around 1800 is the genuine creation of a world culture in which, for the first time, we understand a world history. Remember, this is the first moment at which a really powerful overall historical narrative is constructed, which is based accurately on sources, on the study of what's called material culture, like the, the sculptors themselves. Where we've gone wrong is to see these things simply as property, simply to right. see them as items to which there is legal title and to argue about legal title. The argument about ownership only really becomes relevant with the question of the restitution, particularly of Jewish works, I, I, that have been seized by the Nazis and, uh, and counter seizures by the Soviets after the Second World War. And the argument, I think, has polluted the whole of the way that we look at these earlier questions. We should yeah. use it backwards. Yes, because people often bring up uh, World War II in this argument. And I don't think it is about ownership or appropriation. It's actually about moral relativism, isn't it? Would you say that uh, moral standards are determined by culture and history, or are they absolute? Oh, there are no absolute values. Uh, I mean, God is a human invention, perfectly clearly. And he assumes, <laughs> he, ass he, he assumes his lineaments from mankind and changes his behavior remarkably from period to period, uh, depending on, uh, on, on, uh, on, on changing human values. Um, and again, all of these notions that we are talking about, notions like a national culture, notions like a national history, notions like national heritage. These are all Western inventions. They have absolutely no place in the history of Constantinople or in the history of, of, of Athens. But isn't that the problem, that we've disconnected from uh, British culture and values of the time, which was formed and founded in Christian moral values, and we have a new contemporary set of values that aren't rooted necessarily in the Christian faith, and people are trying to compare the two, which are completely incompatible. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure that I really think that Elgin was, was motivated by anything that one could, you could call really Christian values. You see, I think, again, Calvin, that, that by this fashionable business that, that, as it were, the basis of conservatism is Christianity, leaves out one absolutely fundamental central fact. What are all these people arguing about? They're arguing about the remains of the classical world. Remember, we are a secondary civilization. We are a civilization, as indeed the world into which Christ was born, is the world of Greece and Rome. And the values of Elgin are the values of the classical world. 
uh, our essential new our essential views of politics are much more classical than they are Christian. The language of politics, you know, aristocracy, democracy, monarchy, this is classical Greek. Um, the notion of republic is Roman. Um, so, we, we, but what we are, what we are doing, we're dealing with essentially Western notions, and the notions are creation of highly specific Western civilizations. Most, most particularly, the civilization which, exactly at this moment of about eighteen hundred, becomes the world civilization. That is Anglo America. And, and th this combination of your Christianity and my my increasing tendency to look at the classical world is formed at that moment. And again, Elgin's educational mission, his sense of preservation, his sense of improvement, that's all part of it. The idea is that the, the, these examples of Greek sculpture of 4th, 5th century BC are seen as an archetype. They're seen as a unique peak of human achievement, which will then fertilize other subsequent achievements. And if our culture is um, formed out of the classics and out of Christianity, and conservatism is protecting that culture, preserving it indeed, to hand it down to the next generation, is it not good that we finally have a culture secretary that is willing to address this issue and said it would be a slippery slope to start handing things back? I would agree passionately. The British Museum is a monument to, as its previous director, uh, uh, Neil McGregor, knew so well, it is a monument to a supreme achievement of Western and more particularly Anglo-American, Anglo-British culture. It represents an attempt at seeing a genuine pattern of world history through objects, through documentation, because originally, of course, the British Library was there as well. It was seen consciously as a kind of universal library of knowledge. That, that is what it was seen as. And that seems to me to be something that is noble. It seems to me that is something that's profoundly worthwhile. And it also, of course, represents a peak of a culture. Uh, we know it, you know, with the ancient world, what's seen as a great peak of the culture of the ancient world is in that peculiar uh, again, fusion of Greece and Egypt uh, in the great library of Alexandria. Uh, that is you know, the, the, that extraordinary achievement of trying to bring together the accumulated learning and knowledge of a whole culture. And the symbol of the destruction of the great library of Alexandria is the moment, I suppose, of the, the final fall, not, not, not so much the fall in politics, but the fall in culture of the ancient world. It would seem to me if we start stripping the British Museum and the Louvre and the great museums in Berlin of their treasures, what we're seeing is a similar destruction of the achievement of a universal world culture founded in the West. It would be an equal tragedy to the burning of the Library of Alexandria. David Starkey, thank you very much.